So I'm Roy. I am a senior research scientist in Yahoo Barcelona. Um, since my PhD, I've been working on information retrieval and web search. Now, I don't think it matters that much where, uh, what, what things I work on, but uh, more why I'm working on that. So I think uh, information retrieval is exciting and it's a fun uh, research topic. But one reason is that uh, big companies such as Yahoo hire uh, information retrieval scientists. But apart from that, um, one obvious reason is that I mean, you get to crunch a lot of data. Right? And that's always fun. The second reason is that, to me, information retrieval, it's about um, simple things that really work. Right? So the underlying ideas uh, are, most of them, pretty simple. Right? But they're sort of powerful, and they're working. And you can witness that every day if you, you know, when you use a search engine. Another reason is uh, because I think it's pretty hacky. So you get to you know, program a lot and get your hands dirty uh, on the data and write your own code and your own stuff. And that's a lot of fun. Right? So that doesn't happen so much in machine learning, for instance. Sorry for the machine learning pieces. <clears throat> And the main reason is because it's a very hard problem. So essentially, modeling user-seeking uh, behavior is possibly as hard as full natural language understanding. And that's very hard. So I think that once we solve one, we can solve the other. And we're really far away from that. But the fact that we're trying to get inside uh, the processes of the brain, the cognition that undergoes uh, these, um, these processes is very exciting. Now, um, you know, when I was asked to give this talk, as introduction to information retrieval, most everybody knows about this stuff already. But I couldn't assume that. So essentially, the, uh, the lecture is going to be pretty basic. Um, but there's hopefully some spins in between uh, that, that you'll like. I think I have three main objectives for, for this lecture, which are not very. Uh, uh, pretentious. Say. So one objective is that actually everything that comes later in the summer school rings a bell to you. Um, so these are the basic concepts of just the, the you know, the keywords. Say. Another objective will be um, to get some of you excited about uh, these topics. So if just one of you goes uh, after the talk and gets a textbook on information retrieval or reads all these classical papers or my papers, uh, I'll be very happy. Right? I think the third objective I have is uh, that at least half of you is awakened by the other lecture. Let's see how it goes. Okay. So I'm not sure the clicker is working. There you go. We can't stay on this slide forever, but it's going to be pretty boring for three hours. So. <laughs> um, I think the next slide is uh, essentially giving credit to people. So, um, oh, so I get an automatic slide change. So, um, so a lot of these slides I, I took from uh, Prabhakar, Raghavan, uh, Chris Manning, and, and Henry Schutz's book. So they have the slides online. If you haven't checked them out, please do. They are, it's okay? All right. Okay, they are, they are excellent. So for a lot of parts of this talk, I, I couldn't think of making better slides, so you know, I just asked them for permission to, to use them here. Um, for you guys that uh, have a more sort of theoretical or mathematical incline, this is a uh, tutorial on probabilistic, graphical, uh, probabilistic approaches for IR by Victor Lavrenko and Don Metzler that is online. Uh, that is uh, highly recommended too. And also Monia Lalmas, uh, she was a speaker last year. Uh, she was generous enough to give a uh, hand to me a huge stash of slides from you know, various sources. I don't even know where they come from, most of them. Um, but I'm using uh, some of this material as well. There's also excellent textbooks. Um, I, I need to mention Ricardo Beza Yates' book because uh, it's a very good book, and also he's my boss. <coughs> um, but Prabhakar and colleagues have also a, an excellent book that goes with the slides. So if you, if you like the slides, you can actually read the chapters. And 
that, that go with every, every lecture. But there are many other books around. Right? So this has been a field of interest for uh, like 30 years or more. Right? So essentially, the, the, as a field for over 60 years, already, when four computers were uh, popular. Uh, I got a big plan. I, I really don't know how far we can get or how this is going to take me an hour or, or 20 hours. Uh, but essentially, there's a few things that I want to cover. So um, I want you to like, have an idea of what information retrieval is and web search, what are you know, the, the coincidence and the differences between both, why this is hard. Uh, and essentially, you know, information retrieval is, no, no matter what people tell you, but it's all about the users. So it's all about the people that is using the search engine. Um, and we'll try to, to put ourselves in the, uh, under the hood of the search engine and, and trying to figure out what it's like to be a search engine. Right? So when you try to solve these information requests. And then I'll talk a bit about uh, web search architecture, like you know, briefly and very high level. Um, and a little bit of crawling. We're going to have a full lecture on distributed IR. That's not going to happen. Um, so this sort of is going to cover up for that. Then two main blocks are representation. So how do we uh, tell the machine, how do we represent documents uh, in, in, in the machine language? Right? So how does the computer see the things that you have to retrieve later on? And then modeling, which is essentially the process of deciding that this particular object, this document, is suitable for uh, satisfying your query. And there's a lot of other topics. Uh, I'm just listing them here. I have a few slides on that. Uh, but it's a very rich field. Right? Essentially, I think IR has been um, merging a lot of different uh, techniques from other uh, fields, like databases, distributed system, machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, uh, compression. So all this stuff um, merges together in in information retrieval, and I think that's why so so much fun. Anyway, <clears throat> so what is it? This is a definition from uh, from this book. So it says information retrieval is uh, finding material of an unstructured nature that satisfies an information need from within large collections. There's a lot of <laughs> details to this definition. You'll be hearing a lot of a structured nature, or how to try to make unstructured uh, data, uh, data into a structured data. Um, but essentially, you know, think of web documents, right? So there's half no structure whatsoever, apparently. So it's like a plain text. But this is a loose definition, right? For instance, I was thinking about it. It could be you know, looking for the bill of last night's dinner if we have a large collection of bills. Um, but, you know, when IR uh, began, uh, it wasn't the web. There wasn't, like, super large collections. It was, like... Um, Librarian's job, right? So you can think that's how everything started. How, how people started thinking about this problem of finding information, <clears throat> and, and and this is what it builds upon. So to that definition, so what is a document? I said web pages. So you're biased now. You're thinking that a document is a web page, but it can be many many things. So it can be why not an email, right, or a PDF, or why not. Uh, one paragraph in a document, or one sentence. So essentially, a document is what you want to retrieve. Right? The unit of information you want to display to the user. Um, what does information need? So what all you use to um, uh, use Yahoo, Google, Bing, whatever, and you know that we have to type keywords in the search box, and then automatically the uh, stuff will, will, will come in. But there's something deeper uh, in the process of uh, what things do we want to look for, right? So what types of information needs can we satisfy with the machine? And then what is large? So, you know, these days of big data explosion, uh, that's also not very clear. But what is fundamental here is that all these techniques, they, they do need to scale up. So they are not thought for, you know, just tell me what you're looking for, I'll bring it back in three hours. That, that's not going to work, right? Because kind of were taught that it can be done in less than half a, a second. <clears throat> so basic assumptions, collection, corpus, uh, documents. So it's a set of documents. Um, you can assume it's static. It's not static. So it changes all the time. But uh, dynamics, they introduce a lot of tensions into the, the process in the algorithm. So I think it's better to think about it as a you know, fixed piece of uh, 
chunk, chunk of information that you have there. So what is the goal? So <clears throat> you want to retrieve documents uh, that are relevant to an information need, right? Because you want to complete a task. And this, if I phrase it, you know, it sounds reasonable to you, but for instance, uh, people still not agree on what relevant is, what is the right definition for relevant, and it really depends on the context. <clears throat> so what are the key issues here, or just like the main takeaways? So there's like two big pieces that uh, information retrieval techniques need to deal with. The one is how do you describe information resources, uh, the documents, right? Or information uh, bearing objects, so that will be web pages, but I, I guess in the, the rest of the summer school you'll see that uh, this can be actual data objects, right? so RDF, uh, for instance, or JSON, or whatever. Um, so how can you uh, describe these objects in such a way that uh, you can retrieve them effectively later on? Right? So this has to do with how you organize the documents, how you index the documents, how you put in a data structure, and how you store them. Right? Um, and then the second big piece is how do you find the appropriate documents that satisfy a query? Right? And this has to do with retrieving, accessing, and filtering. So filtering, I'm not going to talk about that, but it's essentially instead of posting a query and, and, and getting a bench, bunch of documents, you know what you want, and all the documents are coming over, and you say yes, no, yes, no. Right? Now, in structured data, I mean, this is a very classical slide. Um, so you know the relational model for databases, so that will be a structured data in its purest form, right? Um, and then on the structured data will be what you use in, in Google or in Yahoo. And everything is different here. I mean, the data is different, so here you, you have the types, you know, you have the relations. You know that uh, 1.5 refers to money and city refers to a particular place, so you know this stuff. But also the query is different. So here you have an SQL statement, which has nothing to do with the query on the right. But even the data you present to the user is different, because here you have, well, you have a potpourri of things here, but essentially you have web documents, and here you will have tuples on the data. So it's essentially very different. I guess we'll learn later on how to link a bit, bring these walls closer a bit. Um, well, this is uh, um, how this has evolved. I remember like in the, mid-90s, you will tell somebody, say, well, it's unstructured data, web, whatever. Nobody is going to be wanting to look into that. You want SharePoint, that's what you want. <laughs> um, so this is like the data volume that was available, unstructured, unstructured, and the market cap. So, you know, there was already a lot of unstructured data in, in the mid-90s, but everything was about Oracle and databases and all that kind of stuff in companies. Now it changed, right? So data has uh, grown a lot but now the web dominates. And, and I, I think this is even uh, higher now than when, when um, this plot was made, right, because of big data and all that kind of things. So now it's, everything is about unstructured data, even in companies. All right, so this is how it looked like. I mean, I, I don't think there's nobody in, in this room that hasn't used search engine. But essentially, you have this box here, you type your keywords, and you get documents. So this is the basic operation. Um, how to do this basic operation? Well, <clears throat> first, you, you need the document, you need the data. So you, you have a process uh, that goes on the web and retrieves these documents for you, right? So it puts them on a, a storage capacity. Um, that's a crawler. That's why you have this huge spider there. And all that goes into the search engine, and the search engine creates an index out of all these documents, all right? And then SpongeBob uh, issues a query, and you're able to display this uh, uh, web page here, right? I think this is of no surprise to anybody. Now, what is slightly more surprising to me is to realize that now search result pages are crowded now. It's, it's, you know, what has this to do with the uh, awful results page that we had before? Right? So here you have a lot of information. So you, know, you have videos, you have news, you have information about the actress, you have related actresses and actors and movies and ads and uh, uh, filters, um, pictures, you know, 
this, this a lot of more information here. And from, from an architectural point of view, each, each one of these boxes here will be a different search engine. So a search engine that looks for images has nothing to do with a search engine that looks for text. That's not completely true, but you know, there are different boxes. At least. The, the basic techniques are the same, so that's why it's good to know them. But, but the boxes are different. I mean, they even go through different data flows, and you need to aggregate these together. So this is not one search engine. This is very many search engines. Um, so I had this uh, little timeline. I'm going to just be going fast through this. Um, how, how this has evolved. So essentially, even before the World Wide Web, there was already a search engine. This Archie, or Archie, or whatever. It's like archive without a V. So it was just listing files from FTP servers. Right? So you had them there. And I think it was two years after the World Wide Web was invented that you have web crawler, which is the first keyword-based search engine. Right? So it, it was crawling pages, and it was indexing the pages the same way we do today. Um, of course, there you go, Yahoo. In the beginning, Yahoo was a directory. Right? So it was categories of web pages, and these web pages were classified or put manually into this category. And you couldn't search the content of the web pages back then. You could search on the, on the directory. That evolved into demos, or ODP, right? which is available right now. Um, you know, many more things happened. Um, of course, possibly the biggest one is the uh, appearance of Google in the market. So uh, Google is dominating. Um, I think, you know, Google had a lot of fuss in, in the year 2000 because it was using PageRank to run web pages. So you know, I like got its popularity. You know, it's a much better algorithm for, for doing that. Um, I think the key invention from Google is that they put a price on keywords. Right? So they, they learn how to monetize search. They learn how to make money out of what you're typing in the search box. And essentially, that is paying for, for search engines and, and information access today, whether you like it or not. But, um, also, interestingly, by the time you got Ask and, and Yandex, which are still in action, so Yandex is huge in Russia bigger than, than Google. And Microsoft started with their first version of, of a retrieval engine around 998, which was pretty late. Also, Baidu is uh, the biggest player in China. Okay. And there's much more things. So I guess uh, lately the, uh, the biggest thing is that Bing now is serving, uh, so acting as the backend for Yahoo. So Bing is serving the service hall for Yahoo. That happened in 2009. Um, so Bing is the evolution of Microsoft's uh, search engine, for those who don't know. And I think like in the last three years, we had this uh, knowledge explosion in search result pages. You know, Google's knowledge graph and Facebook graph search and all these kind of things that are now trying to explode uh, semi-structured data into the search result pages. Anyway. This, I start trying to make a graph on you know, how one company bought another company, how companies disappear, who acquire who. I was a mess, and I think this is the best I could come up with. Um, so, so for instance, you see Yahoo was a big acquirer of search companies, like Alta Vista and All the Web, Overture, and then Ink to Me, and Yahoo bought all of that to, to build a search engine in the early 2000s. Um, there were some failures like Licos and Terra that, that got killed. Uh, Microsoft bought a number of companies as well. And Google did too, right? Uh, interesting, there's MetaWeb there, which was the company that founded Freebase, which I guess you'll hear about later, um, well, tomorrow or the after. Um, and they, they bought a search engine that tried to do, for instance, context, uh, personalized search, right? So it will give you, to you the things that you really care about. Or social search, it will give things to you that are recommended by your friends. So I think this uh, art bar, mark, I cannot even pronounce it, um, was like a social question answering system that Google bought. Essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a complex uh, ecosystem. Actually, I think that in around the year 2000 with the dot-com bubble, a lot of these companies, they just happened to disappear. Sadly. But they were making a lot of money before. So I think it was like in 1998, Netscape, uh, which the, was the predominant browser at the time, it was getting $5 million for, 
from five different uh, big uh, search engine companies to be on their search box. So they, they were rotating. But they were making a lot of money just, uh, uh, just with that. All right, so back to the topic. Uh, so I said this, you know, many, many search engines, right? So information on the table is not just about searching data on the web. It's also searching your email. It's also trying to bring the best ads possible as a response to a user query. Right? Not trying to match uh, these ads there on the top and on the right to the query lab settlement here. Right? So this also uses information retrieval techniques uh, mostly. Image search, again, information retrieval techniques quite differently. So now here, I think the challenge here is well, the real challenge is understanding what the picture is about, and we're really far away from that. We, if, if you follow the um, uh, machine vision literature, you know we're going to identify cuts. But <laughs> I'm not sure how far we've gone from that. And anyway, how this sort of works is that you try to find text that surrounds the picture in the web page. So you have to figure out how the layout of the web page is, and you associate this text into the description of the image, and then you do regular text search as we'll see. Um, well, same for videos. So, just different format, but same techniques, but different search engines. News. Well, this, I say, well, how is news different from standard web search? Well, it's quite different because you really care about new stuff. Right? You don't care about news that happened 10 years ago, five years ago. You, you care about things that are trending now. And essentially, a news index has to be uh, very fresh. So you, you really want the latest things in there to surface to your users. Um, Yahoo Answers. This was the featured question of today. Uh, why do zombies love to eat brains? Uh, ideally, you will have a you know, machine so smart that can give you the answer to any questions you have, right? We're far from that as well. Uh, but you can look for questions that other people have posed and, and trying to figure out which is the best answer there. But again, information retrieval techniques. If anyone knows why zombies sit brains, you can tell me later. Again, uh, searching for files in your computer, right? So now most of the operating systems have integrated uh, capabilities to look for you know, whatever you have stored there, which is pretty useful if you're like a mess like me. Uh, forget what, what you put anything. Um, so this search on, on PowerPoint documents, on Word documents, on text documents, on uh, emails, PDFs, whatever. Uh, and this was um, a standalone desktop search that was open source, and that was called Beagle. I think you can still download it. It was working for, for Linux because there wasn't anything from Linux before. I think now it's integrated with the, with the genome or something. Anyway, so this is Amazon. Right? So you're, you want to buy a CD or a book, and then Amazon tells you these are the related albums. So these are things that you might be interested in. So this is recommender systems. Uh, recommender systems uh, say they drink a lot from user usage information, but a lot of them also have a content side. To it, right? They also look into what is in there to recommend things to you that are similar to the things that you've seen before or you bought before. Again, you know, text representation, natural language processing information. Are two this is the same thing with uh, with movies. I think here you were just answering a few questions that will, that will recommend you the best uh, TV show available for you, which worked pretty well in my case. More things that people thought you could do with information retrieval techniques. Well, look for experts. So who, is the, who are the guys that know more about information retrieval? So you get this list here. Uh, if we put Ricard on, uh, on this list, maybe it's very on the top, then maybe it's very accurate. Um, but, but essentially, I mean, you, you can find expert, uh, expert
expertise information. And in general, now you can find more than people. You can find locations, you can find products, you can find events. Uh, same basic techniques. For you, those who you to know, is just TF, IDF. Wolfram Alpha. Uh, this is a crazy knowledge uh, search engine, I think. Uh, so it has super powerful uh, uh, query interpretation capabilities. So it's able to tell that this thing here, it parses the thing and understands it's a equation, so it plots the equation. But I think you can answer crazy things like, give me the distance from Barcelona to the place where Barack Obama was born. Right? And it's going to give you the distance from the two places. It does this kind of uh, uh, smart resolution of, of things. Again, different from web search. Right? Code search. This was super useful to me until they shut it down. Uh, you can look for pieces of code. Again, representation is different from web documents, but the techniques you use for retrieving stuff and in indexing stuff are the same. So here you could just get snippets of code that uh, could contain your keyword. Jobs. You can even search for jobs online. Uh, I'm not sure there's any fundamental difference from web search, but that, you know, particular domain, particular product that is out there powered by these techniques. All right. There's many, many other examples. I'm going to stop here. Uh, and I have two words of advice for you, which can be applied to some, some other stuff that is not just information retrieval. This might be somewhere in Spain. Uh, essentially, in Spain, we you know, kind of pronounce and write things the same way. There's no uh, difference from pronunciation and, and, and script. Um, so this could have been a Spaniard. That's why I have this funny accent. But this could have been a Spaniard uh, saying, welcome to this, we speak English. Right? And uh, the word of advice I have for you is whenever you try to deploy this thing, whenever you try to write these applications, do not expect the machine to be smarter than you. Right? Really look into the problem. Really look into the data. Really look into the techniques you're putting in there. And try to understand if you as a human being could solve the problem and how you would do it. I do not expect that the machine automatically is going to come up with a solution because it has more access to more data or whatever. Right? That's not going to happen. Uh, maybe somebody doing deep learning could disagree with me on this one. But essentially, for most of the basic stuff, it's not going to happen. Okay? So this might be the, you know, what happened to these guys. Another one is I'm very keen on usability. right? So especially information retrieval is a, is a field that we like to write funky applications and put it in front of users and see how they behave with that, that is pretty cool. Like, uh, but be always very concerned of what you're putting in front of your users. So do you know what this thing here is on the left? So it's, uh, you know already. So it's a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and the name of the Chinese restaurant is Translate Server Error. So what happened here is that the owner or whoever <laughs> went online, if this is true, which I don't know, uh, some people claim it is, and they have been actually there, went online and input the you know, whatever, Google Translate or whatever service, tried to translate the name of the restaurant, and the thing crashed. And it was so badly explained that it crashed that they just thought that Translate Server was the right translation for the restaurant name, and they printed it, and it's now you know, on top of their door. Uh, so you really need to explain to people you know, what things you're putting in front of them. And, and if you're failing, you know, explain them why you're failing. So it's much better to, uh, if, if the human understands why the machine is broken and why cannot figure it out what you want, then, than, than having a, a fatal error that it's impossible to, uh, to figure out. On the right, there's another funky example, which is, I think, a Japanese menu somewhere. And, this story, I really have no idea how it came through, right? <laughs> but they're translating some of the dishes as stir-fried Wikipedia and stir-fried Wikipedia with pimientos. And steam egg with Wikipedia. So I'm not sure if any of you have eaten a Wikipedia before, but maybe some kind of orchid or something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, so, you know, bear this in mind. This is all about the user. Everything you do, test it, understand it, uh, uh, and, and try to explain things. Explaining stuff is very, very important. 
So that's why when you search for things on, 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 a, uh, on a web search engine, you get these little snippets. You get explanations of why this document might be relevant for your query. Right? OK, another one. So can you figure out what this thing is? This is a search engine for something. Can you figure out what this is for? This is Japanese, I think. Yeah, you know, because the ads, right? <laughs> Should cut the ads in the next talk I give. <laughs> uh, but essentially, I think I like this because it's sort of how the machine must feel if it felt anything when you input standard text. Right? You, you read the text, you understand what's there, but I think the machine feels like this. So that's why we have to put all this you know, additional knowledge in top. Um, all right. You know, I think we've been through this a lot. So maybe you are convinced that these techniques had a lot of uh, applications: you know, text, ad, search, image, video, email, question answering, recommendation, desktop uh, file finding, expert finding, looking for jobs, looking for products, looking for news, looking for tweets, looking for video games, aggregating information, mashups, looking for places in a map. So all comes from the same thing, right? and. Uh, I think this is like what would be the trend. Um, so essentially, we're moving into semantic search changes. I don't, I don't think I'm going to say a word about semantic search changes because you get like 12 hours in that. But uh, then it will be NLP. It will be a, a natural language processing. It will be a search engine that understands what you're trying to say. Um, and then maybe a Skynet. I don't know if you want, know what Skynet is, but if you don't, then you won't get the joke. Anyway, uh, so I was requested to put a slide on my own work here. <laughs> and uh, this is another, yet another search engine you know, over a particular domain. And this we call Time Explorer. And it might be online still. So it was you know, this uh, hacky prototype that we pulled together. And there were a lot of interesting elements to this. Um, but I think like the catch is that this thing could predict the future. <laughs> well, nobody jumping. <laughs> no, it really. What this thing did is it went through an archive of documents, of news, of blogs, of, uh, I think that was it, and extracted statements about the future. Right? So you know, somebody says, well, Europe is going to collapse in 2014. Right? Or, uh, you know, I don't know, or Andorra is going to invade Spain in 2014. So you have these statements about the future. So we index all these statements. So you could issue queries like uh, European Union, Greece, in the future. So you get all the statements that people have said about a particular uh, event or a query that you had. And we did more than that. We were aggregating these statements and trying to put some smartness on top. So you, you, you would know who are, for instance,